Jeff and Fresno. Online, we're at kpfa.org. It's about five seconds before two o'clock. Please stay with us for About Health with our host, Rachel Bryant. Good afternoon and welcome to About Health. I'm your host, Rachel Bryant, and today we're going to continue with our series on mental health, taking a much different look or approach to it and making the connection between spirituality and mental health. My guest today, Dr. John F. Hyatt. He's a graduate of Yale School of Medicine and a clinical professor of psychiatry at UCSF and many more accolades. But first, let me welcome you to the show, Dr. Hyatt. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm glad to have an opportunity to be here. Okay, so like I said, we're going to continue the series on mental health and take um, somewhat of a different approach than the other shows that I've done um, and talk about the connection between spirituality and uh, mental health and so if we could just begin there okay what is the connection um it is it is actually that they are intimately intertwined and that the separation of them is artificial and comes from our history um, in which religion and science decided to go different down different roads some hundreds of years ago and that separation helped the science but has in a way impaired some of our capacities to work with problems our patients have and uh, uh, in the uh, healing process. So it's really bringing back together something that belonged together in the first place. And I think there's a distinction between religion and spirituality that we might need to make here. I will be happy to do yes, that. Yes, and what you meant by that religion had sort of separated them. So if you could just make that distinction for us. Yes, okay. Religion is an organized activity. It is really kind of something more at a social level where a group of people decide to share a set of beliefs and a set of behaviors and practices and so on and so forth. And it's very much about community and so on and so forth. Usually the... the um, instigating um, impulse for the formation of religion was spiritual, but it then begins to take on more kind of sociologic um, characteristics and sometimes go so far as to start moving away from the spirituality. Mm -hmm. Um, Spirituality is something inherent in all of us. It's Mm -hmm. as much a part of us as our bodies are. And um, everybody is spiritual in some way or another, whether they are aware of it or not. And um, so... It's trying to tap into that part of the person. That's great. And I know that there must be some very interesting story that you have to tell, a personal story, because you are a scientist. You're a medical doctor and a clinical psychologist. So how did those two, were they separated and rejoined? Tell us about that personal history of yours. Oh, yeah, try and give the short version here of this. Um, it started when I was 17. I was a foreign exchange student to Japan. I was a, a brat um, at that age, and I found myself walking through many hundred years old Buddhist temples, and it just struck me in some very intense kind of way. I felt like being very quiet, completely uncharacteristic. Mm-hmm. And when I came back, I was telling people I'm a Buddhist. I didn't know what I was talking about, but I I identified with something there. And so there was that part was stuck in my mind all along. And as I was going through all my training, um, uh, I knew I was headed towards psychiatry for a variety of reasons. And when I was a resident, I had been exposed to many views of the mind, and they all were supposedly talking about the same thing, but saying something very different. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to integrate it. So I undertook to teach a course to sort of integrate everything. It was going fine right up to the end, and I realized I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be able to do a, a final integration. And I had, at the end of the course, I would put spiritual readings like um, D.T. Suzuki and Carlos Castaneda and so on and so forth. And I knew that somehow the answer lay in there, that, that by, the, by my own spiritual development, I would ultimately come to see how these all related to each other. But I had to do that inside first. Mm -hmm. And so then just kind of went from there. And has that made you an outcast in your professional community? Is it a hard sell to integrate spirituality and mental health? 
or has it or or just tell me what yeah okay how that's um, accepted uh, I have been at my job for over 30 years in the same place, so they all got to know me pretty well, and I had um, quite clearly established my full credentials as a, as a competent, um, hard-headed psychiatrist, good at my job, and so on and so forth, and my personal process was kind of going on outside of that. At a certain point, I decided I needed to bring it in, and I just brought it in without telling anybody about it. it. Just quietly started started doing it. Um, Because I think part of the reason is when somebody thinks they have to, like, convince somebody of something, then you start getting the adversarial. The resistance, yeah. yeah. So I never did that. Okay, and so what you have quietly created, you call the transpersonal experientials. Speak more about what that is. Um, All the religious slash spiritual traditions have as one of their... Uh, practices methods of altering states of consciousness Sufi dancing prolonged chanting and prayer and so on and so forth um, uh, I was uh, I'm 66 now so there was a certain phase in my life where I was indulging in uh, mind altering substances mm-hmm. and I got tired of it I said you know all I'm doing is messing around with my brain chemicals so I can learn to do this on my own so I set about learning to to do that And out of that, I devised a method for fairly simply going into altered states of consciousness, not by any extraordinary means, or but just where you kind of direct your attention. And in the transpersonal experiential, the sort of core, uh, one of the core activities we do is I teach people how to do that. And when you go into um, this altered state of consciousness, I conceptualize it as going to to an airport where you have no idea where you're going. (laughs) You have a ticket in your hand. You don't know where it's to, and you're not going to find out until you're on the other side of the gate. So you can leap off from there many, many different directions. And what comes up next is what comes up next. And um, it is something that invariably um, gives you helpful information about either issues you're struggling with or directions you need to pay more attention to in your personal process. Mm -hmm. I know that, well, I'll speak for myself, that personal process can be really scary. The mind can be an unfamiliar and scary and very busy place. And so as you were going through your experience and with the people that you work with, how how do you work with them to overcome what might come up? Because... I imagine the muck comes up, the dark side, the things that, you know, are hardest for us to face may come up first or strongest. I I have several um, guiding um, principles or or, uh, philosophical ideas. One is that there's a conspiracy in the universe to help us. So that um, when you engage in this, the universe is not going to give you something that's too much that you can't handle. And the amazing thing that I found is that people will come in, they will engage in this, they'll go to some place that's very scary, but it doesn't scare them. Mm-hmm. They're just looking at it and say, wow, I, you know, here I am, and it's okay. And they can then begin to explore that um, almost as if they're an observer. And... That helps to begin the process of reframing, redefining it so that they don't have to have that that terror because it really is the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) I know that you have worked for a long time as well with veterans. You are a um, director of general, general psychiatric outpatient services at the SF Veterans Administration Medical Center. And um, so... I assume that you've worked with veterans around trauma, depression, the full range of right. things. Right, absolutely. I, th- I think there's two things that are currently happening, um, that we have veterans coming home now, and I'm wondering if you're working with that population of Iraq veterans and, and what that's looked like. And then also how some of those same experiences carry over with community members who are experiencing trauma and violence in in just urban environments and what the similarities are there. So first, are you working with returning veterans? Uh, All wars. 
Um, All wars. Lots okay. of lots of Vietnam vets. Um, mm-hmm. More than than um, Iraq Afghanistan vets at this mm-hmm. point, mm-hmm. but we expect those numbers to increase a lot. Right. And um, are you say you work with all wars? So are the is there something you wanted to say? Yeah. No, not in oh, okay. particular. Just okay. you know, I didn't want to focus on right. one and thing because these are all all veterans, and they're not. They're, you know, a lot of the trauma we see has nothing to do with war. Actually, I mean, really? people who are traumatized as kids, sexually and physically abused as children, or they went into basic training and got beat up by their barrack mates. You, you know, right. So the stuff that happens in life, and that's really what I wanted to get at. Mm-hmm. That this is happening all around us every day, all day. And so um, some of the buzzwords, PTSD, right. um, I work with young people and I know that they're experiencing a lot of depression, uh, fear of violence. Like you said, there's no nothing that we need to fear more than fear itself. Um, so how does that translate, your experience working with veterans and um, what we're seeing just in our communities today? Well... One of the questions that I'd like to ask as I'm just sort of mm-hmm. getting, um, you know, opening a dialogue with um, somebody and actually even seeing if they're suitable for this work, because I need to mention this kind of work is not not for, for everybody, right? Um, is, you know, imagine that um, your life is a novel. You're the main character. And you're about halfway through when... Material is included in a novel. It's put there for a reason. Toward the end of the book, you finally find out why that, you know, happened, you know, 80 pages ago, you know, that sort of thing. So imagine that your life is is a novel. Where would this be going? Why would all the things that have happened to you up to this point have happened to you? Where Where is it going or where could it go? What could you um, do to begin to make sense out of all this? And it's very interesting because people usually sort of, react to their lives as I'm I'm a victim, this stuff happened to me and so on and so forth. And if they if they start to see that there either may have been a purpose in it happening or they can they can take meaning out of it, it's like looking at it in a completely different way. And that's like really one of the first crucial steps mm-hmm. is stopping a victim and start looking what can I do with this? Um, you know, where can I go? How can I end up better than I would have ever been if that had not happened to me? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it makes sense. <clears throat> Let's go back and talk about then the transpersonal experiential so that perhaps someone listening, I mean, it's when you're there and you're inertia, you're just there and in victimhood. How do you begin to move out of that? Like just some practical things. I like the question that you ask, you know, if this was part of a novel, where would it fit? What else can we do in our communities just to move beyond um, some of the trauma that we're experiencing. We just live in a violent culture. Yeah. We we do. And, as you know, as much as I would like for social evolution to take place <laughs> within my lifetime, it's not likely to. But I like to think that if more of us have this kind of awareness, the, mm-hmm. the more people that have this kind of awareness, they it, it spreads in their sort of immediate circle. And you just start having many points of of. Um, looking at things in a different kind of way. Uh, you know, I mean, sort of anal- make an analogy with evolution. It wasn't like a bunch of fish decided, okay, now some of us are going to walk. So let's figure out a plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they just slowly started, started changing. And I think a lot of social process is really going to take place that way. And so it's up to each of us individually to try and put as good, positive, growthful energy into society as we can. And stay away from things that um, make a negative contribution to society. So you talk about fear and that that sort of thing. There are forces in our society, very influential forces in our society, that want us to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, no, I'm not going to be afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to come out of a position of fear. I'm going to come out of a position of my authenticity and what I think is really good, good for me, and try and be caring and compassionate. So at some level, that's really the answer to your to your right. question. And the more that society can set up um, resources for people to be able to access, you know, where they can get understanding, they can mm-hmm. not be judged, um, they can be made to feel safe. 
um, that will be helpful because, as you say, there's a lot going on and it's going to continue to go on. We can't stop it, you know, next right. week. But we can try and put out energy and messages that, like, make it more useful. And I do see more of that coming into the media now. Oh, I think more and more, you know, for example, church groups are really starting to kind of get it, not come from a point of view of victimhood, but, but self-empowerment. And I like what you said also is just creating non-judgmental and safe places, whether it's in your own home, in your own mind, in your community, Absolutely. at work, everywhere you go, to just create a non-judgmental and safe space. Right. Yeah. And that is that what you said is so right because that judge that tendency to be judgmental exists with inside us and it is one of the mm-hmm. biggest single obstacles to to growth to mm-hmm. to development because you have a thought you have a a point of view an attitude a reaction and you say that's bad I don't want to have that so you start trying to push it away and when you push that away you start pushing away the truth mm-hmm. and if you can learn to Go inside, look, see what's there without thinking you're bad or good, but just I just want to see what is actually there. How can I change it if I don't know what it is? Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's extremely important. So that not, not and so that's one of the things we do a lot of work on is trying to help people stop making judgments about yourself. Mm-hmm. It doesn't help. Mm-hmm. It just gets in the way. It does. You're listening to about health. My guest today, Dr. John F. Hyatt. And we're talking about the connection between spirituality and mental health. And, in fact, Dr. Hyatt has pointed out that there never has been a separation. If if we had it that way, that was just an illusion that um, our spirituality and our mental health are definitely woven together. If you'd like to join our conversation, you have questions for Dr. Hyatt or you have something to add, give us a call in the East Bay at 848-4425-8. 4425 outside the area 1 800 958 9008. Again, it's 1 800 958 9008. Well, Dr. Hyatt, you said that this isn't for everyone, and I think that's um, another place that just spiritually we need to be that. There are just so many reflections of God, or if you don't call it God, if you call it nature, if however you look at it, there are so many different paths um, to find oneself. And that's why um, we have the variety, I think. Um, (laughs) Yes. So that everyone can find something (laughs) in that garden of spirituality or God um, that they can make peace with and find that non-judgmental space. I want to get back to talking more about your um, transpersonal experientials. You teach that, correct? Yes, you, I do. You certify people. So talk more about what that is like. Um, all the residents who pass through the UCSF um, psychiatry training program get two experientials. They, they spend six months um, with me um, in, the, in the setting where I work. And I do two experientials with them and then allow them the opportunity to continue doing that monthly um, in their second in their third and fourth uh, residency years so um, a certain percentage of them you know choose to keep on doing it because they feel it's helpful for them and they also understand it's a different view of the mind and of change than they are getting exposed to in the, in the mm-hmm. residency that um, that they find helpful and I even have an alumni group that uh, meets once a month, uh, people who graduated as long ago now as um, 14 or 15 years, <laughs> who, who I meet with um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and continue this, this work. And in the transpersonal sensor that I've just um, started, I am offering the opportunity for anybody who wants training uh, to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, okay. So that's that's what I got. All, All right. right, we'll come back to that a little bit okay. later. Let's go to the phone lines now. Autumn in Monterey, thanks for calling about health. Hi. Well, I'm having one of those difficult moments because as a KPFA person, I'm obviously prone toward activism. And, you know, Rachel, I've met you before at a conference, and you're just one of the most sincere, hardworking people I've known. And so I do have admiration, And but I'm I'm... 
I, you all have struck some chords. I've done work for, God, 40 years. Um, I started young, uh, and I'm in a different population of people. And, and there's some things in our culture that are extremely crazy making. And one of them is when the effort is to say we have to be non-judgmental, and then we then have this extraordinary judgment on the word victim. Somehow in our culture, victim is the dirty word. There is no other word that has the sting like victim. Not perpetrator, not predator, not, you know, batterer, like none of these words, you know, military, none of the sources of violence in our culture has this thing. Nobody wants to cringe back from being a soldier or even a batterer or even a rapist. People don't cringe in the way that they cringe from the word victim. And I think that that has to be a point to be looked at because when you say non-judgmental is extremely important for any treatment, and I know it's true, but in my experience, and I've worked in this country, all over, outside the country, and something about making people feel that horrible cringe and responsibility that victim is the thing that's wrong and victim is the thing to not be. Victim has this horrible, nasty, dirty connotation, and every person that's in the popular culture has this thing about we have to not be victims, not be victims. Not There's no equivalent thing to not be abusive, not be violent. There's no other equivalent, you know, effort and energy. And and so I just want to bring that into this conversation because I hear what you're saying at the core and I hear the intention. I don't know you at all, doctor, but I imagine that you're sincere. You certainly sound that way. But it's like if we, we in, in, from that evolutionary model, we've come a long way, but we have to keep expanding our experience. And if we're saying that we're not going to be judgmental, then perhaps we might start by not having, and I know what you're trying to get at because I've seen also the experience when people move from feeling like they are helpless and powerless and unable to do anything the way they were when they were being victimized. But that victim is somehow the dirty word. Victim is the thing. It's, it, there's something about that that's very, very destructive. And I, I get, you know, you get a certain population I get another population, the casualties of people desperately trying not to be victims, and their whole attention is pointed in a direction that actually is is self-destructive as well. So I just I want to insert that into the conversation because I know you all are very sincere in what you're saying, but you know it's it's again that crazy making thing like some of the audience is going to tune out as soon as you start the direction of you know we can't be victims because then there's no way to have the the so-called respect or reliance because then the person feels battered right out the gate so that's my contribution and you've made it well thank you autumn for the call and i'm going to turn that one over you, Dr. Hyatt. If I if I gave the impression that I was making a negative judgment about being a victim, I um, I'm sorry about that. That wasn't my intent. Really, the way I like to frame it is to the person is how helpful is it to you to stay in that mindset? You may be, you may have been a victim, and we got to acknowledge that. Um, but if you continuously, 24 hours a day, live from that mindset you will not be able to change. And so it's, it really is a question of whether it's helpful or not as opposed to whether it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. And I also can totally feel what Autumn was saying, um, that we victim we re-victimize victims by judging Absolutely. being a victim, if that makes any sense. So thank you, Autumn. Your point was well made. There's um, not much more to add to it and well taken on this end, too. Let's continue on the phone lines with Daniel from Oakland. Daniel, welcome to About Health. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. I am a survivor of all of the uh, types of trauma uh, that have been talked about on the program today, and 
I refer to myself, I was when I was a child. I was powerless. I was a victim. But I'm not powerless as a survivor. And I strongly encourage the use and the substitution for victim and victimhood with survivor and survivorship. Okay. Did you have a question, Daniel? Well, um, yes, I do. I wanted to make that comment. And, Thank you. Uh, uh, particularly because I, I have been listening very carefully as I, you know, this is one of the programs I try to faithfully <laughs> tune into, and I, I have been a member that. of KPFA since at least 83, but I think 81. Um, my question is to Dr. Hyatt um, and or to you is, has this concept, of survivor and survivorship as opposed to currently one I self-identifying or being identified by others as victim and victimhood, um, but rather, um, especially he mentioned transpersonal, and I am quite familiar uh, with uh, the, at least former, I'm not sure it still exists, I think it does, the uh, John F. Kennedy School um, of Transpersonal Counseling at JFK uh, University in Orinda. Uh, and, and so I was wondering if uh, A, uh, Dr. Hyatt, had had any personal experience with that program, uh, either personally and or in the past. And secondly, and and by the way, I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, add to that that uh, um, that program uh, was introduced by the the core original. Uh, founding, uh, shall I say, I think core original founding uh, individuals who were Sufis. Uh, okay, um, Daniel, okay. I'm going to have to prompt you to please right. so your I second question. So, 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 my, so my question, therefore, and I myself am an aspiring human being and aspiring Buddhist. Uh, so I, I want to ask Dr. Hyatt those two questions and, and to comment on anything else. Okay. Thanks for your call. Um, first off, I want to say I like your reframe from um, looking at yourself as victim, looking at yourself as survivor is more self-empowering, and I think that really is extremely important, that um, that kind of self-empowerment. I hope I can remember everything you brought up. Um, JFK Transpersonal Program does still exist. I have not been um, directly involved with them, although I have known people who have been associated with that program. And the other was was it was it a question? Did I did I miss the the, uh, the question part of it? I mean, you know, certainly in terms of in terms of the spiritual traditions, uh, you mentioned Sufism and and Buddhism, and they're both ones with which I am very sympathetic because I think they tend to make access to the sort of mystical aspects of our existence a little bit more available than maybe some other traditions. Um, I hope that addresses what yeah. you were bringing up. And what I really appreciate about your call, Daniel, is you said, I'm an aspiring human being. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like that too. We that should was, all that was be funny. aspiring human beings. Right. So thank you for your call. That was good. A lot of the work that you do deals with different states of consciousness, and we've referred to getting there from many different paths. And um, in your uh, on your website, it says that this can be likened to a waking dream, and it's a dreamlike quality in which ordinary limits of time, space, causality do not apply to things 
that seem impossible and things that seem impossible can happen. I would like for you to expand upon that because I think that that veil between the energy world and what we perceive as real, um, very few people have the opportunity to truly cross through that. And so what would that be like? What um, has that been like? Yeah, I want to say several things just for us as a preface. We actually do all the time. We just don't pay attention to it. <laughs> we sort of let those moments go go right. by as if they okay. didn't even happen because we don't. Our, our society t- teaches us not to value them. Okay. And so this is really training you to do something you actually already know how to do, but you learn how to do it on purpose. When you go into this state, um, you know, people have asked me for years, well, what is it you do or what is it like? Is it guided meditation? Is it this? You know, and I say, no, it's none of the above. And, and the best analogy I can come up with is like a waking dream. If, if you've had lucid dreams where you're dreaming and you know you're dreaming, mm-hmm. um, it's the same as except you're, 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 you can move. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In the lucid dreaming states, you're often just kind of sort of lying there watching what's, what's going on. Uh, but but it has a, the dreamlike quality in which things are sort of flowing along and stuff happens and you don't know where it came from and so on and so forth. Um, but you you can be proactive. I mean, you can you can you know if if somebody appears to you, you can ask them questions. What are you doing here? What do you want? You know that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you know what I say to people: this is your experience, so you can do anything you want to 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 find out what it's about to gather as much information as you possibly can. Um, uh, in in it, and afterwards you can remember totally everything that happened. You 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 can write down almost verbatim what happened dur- during the experience. So that's a, that's the thing you know I like like about it. It has that that flowing quality that a dream does, and it brings in stuff that you go, what was that? Uh, so you know it's interesting and helpful, but you remember it all, and you you're a participant. And I guess I'm still trying to put my finger on exactly how you get there because you say it's different from meditation or guided imagery. There's no LSD. There's no hypnosis. Um, and perhaps one must experience it. it. Like you said, it's after all these years, it's difficult to describe because it's not for our intellect. It's for our being to experience. So. Yeah, usually when I am starting to work with somebody, I don't. I don't tell them an awful lot okay. ahead of time about what's right. what's what's going on because I have you know knowing my own head, I know that we are quite capable of experiencing whatever we expect to experience, uh-huh. yeah. and I want people not to know what <laughs> uh, what they expect to experience so that when it happens, they go, "Where did that come from?" I say, "Isn't that interesting?" Okay, um, that's that's you know kind of kind of the deal, but it's 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 simple um, actually. All right. <laughs> Most beautiful things are simple and free in life. Absolutely. 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 And we miss them, as you pointed out. It's always happening. We just miss them. Yeah. Uh, if you would like to join our conversation today on About Health, I'm interviewing Dr. John Hyatt about uh, transpersonal experientials. And the number in the East Bay is 848-4425, outside the area, 1-800-958-9008. We're going to continue with callers now. Risa from Oakland, thank you for holding, and welcome to About Health. Thank you. My question, um, I'm just wondering if there's a specific application toward parenting and the relationship between parents and children. I know it was a, a very challenging for me to be a parent and to deal with my own, um, what would you suppose, to, to interfere with the child. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering if, you know, this technique could be used to deal with your, you know, your impulse to... <laughs> You know, Just um, say, Arisa, yeah. all parents know what you're not saying. <laughs> I raised three. <laughs> Just call it what it is, and no one's going to call Child Protective Services because we've right, all had our right. moments with our children. Yes. Right. I mean, to deal with the, your the own violence in, in my nature yes. that I sometimes felt toward my child, I used to call parental stress hotline, and they'd just keep asking me questions until the whole thing just diffused and that was my way with dealing of dealing with it but um i was just lucky there was always somebody on the other line but sometimes 
you know, I would get really mad or something. I wouldn't know how to deal with it. And I'm just wondering if that technique could be used to find a peaceful way to parenting in yourself. Good question. Um, 100% time of peace in parenting is probably not possible and probably not desirable. Um, because as you, as your child makes you angry and you deal with it, you are helping to show them how to deal with anger. If they never ha- see anybody do it, they, they won't know how to do it and they will be at, at risk of impulsively lashing out at some point or another. So, so much of what we do is modeling. It's very important. And the only suggestion I would make is that if, if you learn to do to yourself exactly what you did with the hotline is get, get a little play phone, ask a question, make a comment back, you know, talk yourself down in a, in a, in a way. Or, you know, we all, all need to learn to do that. We need to say, where is that feeling coming from? Why am I having that strong a feeling about this? Take a little time out and see if you can figure it out. If you can't figure it out, if it's not obvious, and you say, okay, well, then maybe I shouldn't react that way right now until I figure out why I'm so upset about it. Um, it's it, it's basically the process you did. You were you were lucky. You were in a place where you had access to somebody who could help you. Um, ultimately, you can teach yourself to do that to yourself, and it's probably the suggestion I have. And don't don't strive to to never be angry. There are things that make us angry. Um, the whole animal kingdom is capable of getting angry. It's like part of, you know, what's what's nature. <laughs> and then sometimes your eight-year-old, as mine did a few weeks ago, asked me, Mommy, who made you angry when I was getting snappy with her? So um, I think you're absolutely right as a parent that it's okay to model and to show how to deal with the full range of human emotions. Absolutely. And more importantly, how to deal with them, how we deal with them models for our children. Absolutely. How to deal with them. Absolutely. Yes. And it's learned usually from our parents, how Ab- we react to our kids. There are prime examples for our parents. Yes. yes. Scary. Let's continue on the phone lines. Tess from San Francisco, welcome to About Health. Hi. Um, I'm a woman in her mid-50s, and when I was a teenager, my life really started to change. I developed serious anxiety and depression, but along with that came a real strong sense of disconnection and otherworldly almost, Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time trying to keep my feet in the normal ground by going to school. And um, So I actually did a lot given the circumstances but then drugs came out and boy they really helped me a lot I, it was a miracle um and now uh let me just go step back a second um before taking medication i did a lot of stress therapeutic things like um yoga like biofeedback um a little meditation and I found that they actually all made me worse because the last thing I wanted to do was to focus in on this serious symptomology I was having. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, meds turned that all around, and um, I am now older and wanting more of a um, sophisticated or I don't know what the word is, spiritual maybe, um, life. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure how to proceed because uh, of my difficult past experience with anything that was um, body or mind focused. So, do you have any suggestions for me at this point? Um, I think, uh, remember if you listen to the program, I said something about there is a conspiracy in the universe to help us. If you sincerely ask, you'll something will come into your path that suggests itself um, this may be helpful your intuition may say i want to i want to check that out um i i want to say here very sort of parenthetically um not only do i not have any problem with um medications but i am probably directly or indirectly responsible for as as many <laughs> psychotropic drug prescriptions as anybody in my setting um, we use them quite frequently, and that is because sometimes symptoms are so strong that a person cannot get to the place of really comfortably being able to do the kind of work that they need to do for the long-term fix. Um, so that's fine. And it, apparently you have reached a point in your life where you're saying, okay, I'm ready for the next step. And uh, what that's going to be for you, I do not know. It's different for different people. 
Um, I don't, you know, I mean, uh, there's an old saying that comes out of, I think, the, the early Hindu scriptures that there are a thousand paths to God, which is to basically say in some way or another, our path is our individual path. And so that if we try and go into some structure, you got to do this, you got to do that, it, it may be helpful for some people and not for you. And so any specific suggestion I would make at this point would would be my projection as opposed to knowing anything about you but i think your impulse is right is to is to start looking that that direction and uh, just open yourself ask the universe help me you know put some you know, put something into my path into my level of, of awareness that helps me to um, get some ideas about directions that might be useful uh, to me. You can ask your dreams. It's, it's, it's amazing. If you go to sleep every night and you say in your dreams, really, please give me some help tonight, give me some ideas, eventually something will come up. I mean, you will, you'll, you'll get an insight, something that is a path that fits for you. Um, and it may take a couple of tries. It's okay. Don't, don't, don't worry. Does that answer your question? Oh, I think Tess isn't on the line. Oh, okay, she's not on the line. Well, well for, I hope it answers the question. I think very well. I hope so, Tess. If not, give us a call back. Uh, the number in the East Bay is 848-4425 outside the area, 1-800-958-9008. For those who are listening that are interested, oh, Tess, she is there, Tess. Yes, hi. No, hi. it was very helpful. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, so for those of you who would like to go deeper and what um, Dr. Hyatt is speaking about today resonates with you, you do have workshops for this. Um, I have I have a variety of settings. I've, I've opened a transpersonal center so I can work with people individually. Um, I have some ongoing groups. I have periodic workshops that people could come to for a weekend and, you know, uh, get exposed to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would encourage people to either call or um, visit my website and send okay. me an email. Let's give out that information now. Okay. My phone number is uh, 510-558-0521. And my website is um, Transpersonal Center, all one word, um, dot com. Mm-hmm. So you just go into there and there's a place where you can... Um, you can um, make comments or you know ask questions or things like that. I'd be more than happy to answer any inquiries that uh, people have. And what you say on your website, transpersonalcenter.com, is that this work and particularly the workshop is for people whose life experiences have readied them for this work and they're serious about spiritual development both in themselves and the world around them and that sounded like exactly where Tess was coming from. That's exactly where Tess was coming from. She's she's the, the right place. The thing I'm not as enthusiastic about is the is the kind of curious weekend mm-hmm. shoppers you know go to a, who it's important that people take themselves seriously mm-hmm. uh, your life is is important mm-hmm. and um and if you sincerely want to help yourself to change to grow uh i'd love to do anything i could to help you with okay. that Great. So, again, the website, transpersonalcenter.com. Your phone number once again? uh, 510-558-0521. And I've got his email. It's Hyatt, H-I-A-T-T, at transpersonalcenter.com. If you want to contact Dr. Hyatt that way. We have so many available means. Yes. (laughs) And with that, we'll go to the technology of the telephone and continue with our callers. Robert from Concord, thank you for holding and welcome to About Health. Well, thanks for taking my call. Um, Just to kind of give you a quick background, I'm a student and I'll be I'm going to major in uh, psychology, psychiatry. That's my plan. And um, the question for Dr. Hyatt was, um, what would you, or what are the differences between um, the type of spiritual um, psychiatric treatment that you use as compared to um, something that I'm going to be taught in college? Uh, that's a very good question. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I like to say that is that I cast a, a broader net. I do not exclude um, traditional uh, Western methods um, of 
uh, regular psychotherapy, behavior therapy, CBT, and all that, you know, all the, all the ordinary things fit. Um, but the transpersonal perspective looks a little bit, um, beyond that. And, uh, and basically looking at us as spiritual beings. And so that, um, uh, you know, for example, if a person comes into you and starts saying, I'm having this experience, that experience, and it's kind of weird and I'm scared and so on and so forth, a traditional therapist might respond as if this is a, um, there's something, you know, a, you have a problem and uh, we need to fix it, so I'm going to give you a treatment to fix it. And sometimes, um, you know, in dealing with a person, I'll say, okay, so that's bothering you. It doesn't mean you're ill or that you need treatment per se. Um, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples is you say, I, I meet people who say uh, they're, they're having, um, you know, um, clairvoyant experiences or, or something like that. And it's freaking them out because they somehow think that you know, if they see something ahead of time, particularly if it's bad, they should change it. And uh, I will say, no, well, no wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it, maybe this is like perfectly okay and maybe it's just you need to accept that part of yourself as opposed to feeling like there's something wrong with you um so it casts a broader net it 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 may be accepting of a of a wider variety of human experience um as not indicating pathology but just that we are um we're quite various and um so I, I I hope that answers your your question. Um, it, it 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 adds on to to what you were doing. That's where I came from in my in my development. I learned all the regular stuff and do it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for your call. I want to go back to an earlier comment that you made, Dr. Hyatt, about drugs and the judge part of me, the judge in me, when you said, you know, I prescribe as many psychotropic drugs as the next psychiatrist. Cringed. And I am on the outside of your field, so um, I don't know. And Tess even said that it really helped her. So yes. I haven't had that personal experience on either end, being the patient or the doctor. I do know that a lot of people self-medicate with street drugs, alcohol, shopping, whatever. I mean, it's um, whatever it is that will ease their serious psychotic symptoms um and i'm just wondering um what your take is on that because there are people there's a there's a stigma like i said the judge and me said oh the psychotropic drugs um yeah. and so they tend to, to go the other route with yeah. what's available because either they don't have access or because they don't want to be categorized well the access thing is a whole different issue we we need everybody in this country to have access to to quality health care we just simply need that moving out of the political arena okay <laughs> good idea um, um most self-medicating things that are available to people um are harmful to you more harmful to you than um, prescriptions that come by a doctor's evaluation number two is that often our perception of the of our of our problem is a little bit off base mm -hmm. and so it's helpful to go to somebody who is experienced and who can say who can f help to frame it for you so you understand what the uh, the uh, the uh, problem is um, and so that your efforts are directed at at the real source of it as opposed to just a manifestation of it on the outside. Having said that, the, the drugs that are available, there are some people who are so depressed, they can't, they can't do anything. I mean, they can't, you know, they barely even get enough food in them to stay alive. They, you know, just don't care about anything. And in order to do work on yourself, as you alluded to at the beginning, it's, it's hard work to, to work on yourself. Mm -hmm. so you gotta have, you gotta have your faculties available to you. You need mm -hmm. to be able to concentrate. You need to be able to remember. Mm -hmm. And if you're like very anxious or very depressed, you can't do those things. And so, so it's very helpful for people like that to get those symptoms within bound, not to eliminate them. That's not the goal, to eliminate them, because they're there for a reason, but to make them so within bounds that they can then proceed to do the work they, they need to do to fix whatever it is underneath that is 
causing the symptoms. Okay, so my second question is, like people who drink or smoke weed or whatever, their medication of choices eventually come to terms, some come to terms where they get off of that and start dealing with the root, is it the same with psychotropic drugs? Do people, is the goal to move people away from drugs or? or In wherever possible, the okay. idea would be to eventually liberate them from the need for that. Okay, that's great. Let's continue on the phone lines with Vicki from Oakland. Thanks for holding and welcome to About Health, Vicki. Hi, was that Becky? Because Oh, I'm, Becky, I'm sorry. Right. Becky, it's you. Uh, right. Welcome. Okay, great. Hi, thanks. Okay, my question is, um, how do you feel about um, children um, being, um, okay, being diagnosed as mentally ill in this country and um, how music and the arts and using the creative process can help benefit children in um, working and you know, use that as a channel for the creative process to deal with what could otherwise be called a mental illness and therefore have children be prescribed um, you know, psychotropic drugs, which either in a case they may actually need medical help, if, um, you know, music and art could be a way of helping them, or you know, in some cases they may be even di misdiagnosed. So um, how, do you have any ideas on that? You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, it, there's a lot of overdiagnosis of, um, of of problems in children regarding it as pathological as opposed to they're just either kind of a unique individual or they just took a wrong turn and all they need to be say, oh, here's the road over here. There are many, many outlets. Uh, you mentioned music and art, sports. There are lots of outlets where 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 things can be channeled that can help a person. And uh, it's an unfortunate aspect of our society that, um, you know, part of it is that the healthcare people are often so busy that they are just kind of um, dealing with people in a very um, uh, quick way and don't take the time to to go in deep enough to see the nature of the uh, the problem. And it's so easy to pick up a pen and start writing a prescription saying, I fixed it. Um, you've just temporized. So the point you're making, I absolutely 100% agree with. Hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just like to say I'm a musician. And um, for that exact reason, which I've observed and, you know, our society here, that's why I'm actually doing my own music education programs in the Bay Area. Good so for thank you. you. Good for you. And thank you. Thank you, Becky, for doing the work. I think as many ways as those of us that are aware that, uh, without getting political again, Dr. <laughs> Hyatt, how much art and culture and beauty and dance and song and all of those things that give our life depth are disappearing in our schools as much as we can see that and um, move toward providing it in our communities in whatever way we're moved to do it, um, I think the better. So thank you, Becky, for doing the work. Jim in Fresno, welcome to About Health. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm calling because, and I think Dr. Hyatt will recognize this, I'm a Groffy. Uh, Stan Groff <laughs> is an individual I've practiced with for, since 1991. I have two questions for you. One specifically because of your work with the VA. Have you put together any materials that a person could get from you? Because I'm working now and attempting to get into the VA with Groff work as an approach to dealing with PTSD. And if I have some written materials from people with other experiences, that would be helpful. And, and I, I've got most of the, your contact information, so basically I think I can contact you about that. But do you have written materials on it, number one? And number two, is there a reason when she's asking you about the transpersonal experience, you're not talking about the fact that the breath is involved in this process? I don't, I don't do it the way Stan does. I know you don't. So. Um, I, uh, I, I, I know Stan. He is responsible for my current marriage, whether he knows it or not. Okay. Um, and I thank him for that. Um, <laughs> right. I met her in uh, '82. Right. Um, and uh, no, I don't have much written material. 
Um, that's it, it, that's 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 partially theoretical. Uh, the the last article I wrote did did not cover any of the stuff we're talking about today. It really kind of covered some of the spiritual background or the uh, okay. the, the sort of the theoretical background. Okay. Um, I, I I don't have written material for for several reasons. First off, what I said earlier, I wanted to be a, so, you know people not to know ahead of time what's what's going to happen in a way. And the other is is that I am one of those people who spent so many lives, uh, so much of his, their lives inside their their heads, my head, that I realized you know I I got to stop. The intellect's going to get in my in my way. Um, and so I. Um, Basically stopped writing and um, uh, you know trying to intellectualize this whole thing you know in a, in a such a way that I could describe it um, real clearly to somewhere else. And if you want to get into the into the VA with the gruff work, don't 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 call it that. Call it something else. <laughs> yeah, be an original. <laughs> and well. if you would like to contact Dr. Hyatt, I'm going to give out thank his you. number. And thank you for your call, Jim. Um, Please do get that material, uh, the the contact numbers again. Sure, I'm going to give it out right now. So to contact Dr. Hyatt, uh, you could reach him by phone in area code 510-558-0521. Again, that's 510-558-0521. By email, Hyatt, and the last name is spelled H I A T T at transpersonalcenter.com, the website transpersonalcenter.com. He doesn't have a book. He doesn't have a CD. <laughs> He's just a, a simple guy that has showed up here. Talk about judgment. I was like, is our guest here? Yeah. So, oh, okay. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. I think we have time to squeeze one more caller in, and I think it's a return. Scott from Sacramento, Welcome back. Did you Hi, have another question? For, uh, I actually, it's the first question I had. I got disconnected before, but um, I have a question for you. Um, you were talking earlier about lucid dreams, and I have a situation. I um, actually, uh, one of my children, when they go to bed at night, they they dream, but they talk in different languages, and they actually um, have. At age four, my son would talk. Uh, about theorems and different things, sleep, which he's never been exposed to before. I just don't know if that's some kind of a lucid dream or um, he knows the logarithms and everything while he's asleep, but he's awake. He's a normal four-year-old boy. So... There are several possible explanations, all of which you have thought of, and um, he, right now you don't know which one it is. Um, he's either tapping into somebody else's mind and in dreams and in the transpersonal experientials, we can travel, we can, we can tap into other people's minds. This could be a past life thing. I mean, this could be any one of a number of things. And one of the, the things I feel is very important in doing this kind of work is to keep your mind open. Don't, don't shut out any possibility as long as it is, is not inconsistent with the data that you have in front of you. It's data first, interpretation second, and you open your mind because the universe is just an absolutely amazing place and the stuff that takes place here is uh, boggles your mind as you begin to open it. So something very interesting is happening um, in your son's dreams and... Um, just enjoy it. Uh, and wait and see yeah, what it all means. It's definitely been interesting. He speaks Chinese, fluent Chinese. When he's asleep, he's not Chinese whatsoever. Um, he's spoken cool. uh, German. He's spoken Italian, and quite a bit also. Just one or two words. My my wife is fluent Italian. Uh, she speaks Italian fluently, and and even though she doesn't speak it around him ever, um, he can mm. actually converse with him when he's asleep. When he's asleep. She can converse with her. So that's neat. Um, I think it's way cool, and I think that if we could all have the mind of your four-year-old, the openness of that mind, the unpolluted mind we did of your four-year-old. There's a Zen concept, beginner's mind, um, that makes allusion to what you're talking about. Just stay open. We, we, we had it. We can retrieve it. Um, our first-grade teachers tend to done it out of us. You are-
are invited to hear stories and see slides about how the biggest oil spill on Earth has affected lives in the Amazon rainforest. Texaco spilled the oil. Chevron bought Texaco. No one cleaned it up. Lou DeMottis, author of Crude Reflections, Oil, Ruin, and Resistance in the Amazon Rainforest, will speak about the human and environmental damage. The event benefits the Mount Diablo Peace and Justice Center and is on Tuesday, July 1st at 7 p.m., 55 Eckley Lane, Walnut Creek. Suggested donation, $12 to $20. Students, $5. Call us at 925-933-7850. This is KPFA or KPFB 